Syracuse, New York, 1978. You're walking home from your 12 hour shift and you're very, very tired. It's been a long week, so you very much deserve taking a break. After opening your apartment door and trying to correct your signal, you end up seeing something that, without your knowledge, was also being seen by much of the city. And that something was a broadcast. It was a channel that played recent movies. For free, no less. You didn't know what to call this channel. Nobody did. Because what you witnessed that day was the first time anything like it ever happened. Hello and welcome to another episode of What Was. And in this video, we will talk about the very first pirate channel in history. Going against the perceived norm has been something billions of people have tried accomplishing throughout history. From rebellious teenagers to resting peasants, it's almost a given at this point that all people have at least one time in their life where they don't follow the rules. And possibly the most important rule that many generations of cultures broke out of sheer rebellion is disrespecting authority. For many, disrespecting the people who made those rules in the first place gave them a shot at full autonomy. And no other time in someone's life does a person want full autonomy than the teenage years. The bridge between childhood and adulthood means you learned how to survive yourself and stop taking advice from the old generation. The old generation always wants to keep things clean and nitty, but once the teens start to go in the opposite direction, they suddenly reconsider their decisions. Because you can't just live the same life forever, doing the same things forever. Humans are adaptive beings who change over time, but sometimes to instate a change, you need to have a reason for change. As a matter of fact, some more. Emil Patron, the head retracted it. The television seems like an obsolete thing nowadays. Perfectly sanitized and protected broadcast that you can just see on your computer instead of watching from a giant rectangle. The monotony of the common TV station was even worse during the late 20th century. With only a few channels and static in between, the fast moving new generation eventually got tired of it all. So they started thinking of ways to do something different. More people are, as we cocologists say. Catching the wave. Catch it if you can, can. Catch the wave. Coke. In 1977, during a news bulletin on a southern television channel, the audio was temporarily replaced with declaration of peace from alien-like beings. This audio lasted for six minutes, most likely because the broadcasters never experienced anything like it before. After the interruption ended, the broadcast temporarily ceased before returning once more. The news reporters who were interrupted described the incident as a breakthrough in sound. And they were right. In more ways than one. The incident became known worldwide and it captured the imaginations of conspiracy theorists and like-minded individuals alike. They had finally seen what could be done with enough equipment and sheer will. And this would eventually inspire a few Syracuse University students to experiment with something no one had attempted before. Using their knowledge in the field of electronics, the group of students eventually managed to find a broadcasting ground near the school chancellor's house and got all the equipment needed to make it possible, including an old guitar amplifier to enhance the sound. After gathering tapes of many movies and TV shows from people that saw them when they aired on TV, they had decided on a place to put it, in between one of the channels, on the seventh style, an unoccupied frequency with only static. For this broadcast to get unnoticed, they had to be pretty lucky. But they did it anyways, because well, why not? On the eve of April 14th, Syracuse citizens accidentally dialed their channels to the 7th channel, but instead of seeing static, they saw...
After stating the mission of the channel, the broadcast cut to a film. Now the exact film or show that was shown afterwards is unfortunately not known, but we do know the names of all the films. Any of these films could have been shown right after one another on separate broadcasts and we just wouldn't know about them, but from what I've gathered, from 2am to 6am, the broadcast showed an unknown amount of films and reruns of old 60s TV shows, and it ended with a declaration from the gas masked figure, stating that the broadcast reached half of the Syracuse area, and then it cut to a station ID of a pair of lads rolling into a 7, with female backup singers singing the name of the channel, Lucky 7. This was the end of the first broadcast. The first of three, that is. April 15th began just like any other day. A quiet evening with city ambiance and chatter in the background. The second broadcast has just begun. Just like the previous one, they showed a few films and reruns of old TV shows, but this time the broadcast managed to reach a wider audience since it broadcasted a lot earlier, at 8pm to be specific. Many students of Syracuse University caught the offering and were extremely intrigued by it, however others were a lot more critical, including the Federal Communications Commission of the US government. To them, this illicit programming was completely illegal, and once the broadcast stopped, they should have tracked down the programmers and arrested them. But since the second broadcast ended, there wasn't anything on the seventh dial, so they had to wait to see if there would be a third one. And soon enough, they would witness that exact thing. The final broadcast was being watched by too many people to even count. If the first one was shown to half of the Syracuse population, this broadcast was seen by almost the entirety of it. Suddenly, the student experiment grew way bigger than anyone could have hoped for. An entire city and a government organization started watching them. But really, after all this media frenzy, you have to ask yourselves, how did the broadcasters even react to this? We're scared shitless. I think the whole thing has been blown way out of proportion. I hope it dies down. Channel 7 Programmer The city of Syracuse watched as the broadcast concluded at midnight with a statement from the figure with the gas mask. And that concludes our nightly broadcast. The reason why we made this channel was to test the waters for future programming, and soon you will see many more just like this one. You wanted to see how people would react to a channel with no commercials and just films. Thank you for watching the Lucky 7. Static. While the broadcast had ended, the story isn't quite over yet. The newspapers and news stations picked up the event quickly. Meanwhile, the FCC tried tracking down the signal with all the equipment they had. These broadcasters seemingly disappeared and never went to Syracuse University again. The entire university knew about the incident after all, but they respected the Channel 7 broadcasters wish to remain anonymous. They were practically on the run, but despite all the efforts of the FCC, they failed to actually catch the broadcast pirates. This was the first time the FCC was involved in anything relating to television hijackers, and just like the Lucky 7 broadcast, it would happen again two more times in the 80s. A time right with commercialism and fake smiles. Isn't it the perfect time to catch the waves and ride it till you hit the sand? Nineteen eighty-six, John R. McDougall was an owner of a satellite dish selling company, but his sales have been recently declining thanks to the scrambling of HBO's channel. As a protest of HBO's high satellite dish pricing, before he went home, he set up his empty color bars and text stating, "Good evening, HBO," from Captain Midnight. $12.95 a month? No way. Showtime slash movie channel? Beware. He then named the transmission this to the Galaxy One, and soon enough, 8 plus million HBO subscribers all across the eastern United States saw the transmission. After 90 seconds, McDougal realized the situation and quickly stopped the transmission. But it was too late. The FCC and the FBI became involved, and after 200 false reports of people claiming to be Captain Midnight, they tracked down McDougal. It led to a court case and he eventually paid a fine and went on probation. As a result of this high profile case, the congress passed a law deeming broadcast hijacking a felony. A signal ID system was also developed afterwards, but it wouldn't help catch another case just a year later.
Chicago television station, someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on double... Find out who's responsible for two acts of video piracy. Another one is on tonight, this one for the video pirates. Managed to scramble Chicago airways. The pirates interrupted WGS and WTTW programming with a show of their own. Our Mike Hirsch has more. What is there to say about the Max Hedrum hijacking? Really, it's not even a minute long video. It's a monument. A triumph of sheer bravery and insanity. Nearly a decade after Lucky 7 aired, it bluntly stated, well, TV's boring. And yeah, you need something different every once in a while. Disrupting the signal is the first step in full rebellion after all. And yeah. The morality of broadcast hijacking is contentious just like every other topic. You may call it immoral and illegal, or the other way around. I guess in a way it's just human nature to think differently from others. And maybe, just maybe, when a few university students with TV equipment managed to transmit a signal to an unoccupied channel, they just wanted to, well, create a difference, however big or small. The stories we have covered today all have been extremely influential in many ways. But you can also speculate about the things they didn't inspire. Any one of these individuals could have started global annihilation and they didn't. Because they understood the sheer power they had with television, so instead of doing it themselves, they implanted the seeds and waited for future generations to do all the work. McDougal inspired hundreds of HBO subscribers to go out and protest the high pricing. The Max Hedrum incident inspired a generation of counterculture teens and trolls. At the end of the day, the ones who disrupt media are one of the few interesting oddities we can end up seeing in our day-to-day -day monotonous lives. Those few students managed to pull something so monumental it got covered in the New York Times. They got what they wanted, and despite all the legal questions, maybe that is a good thing. A program that said the Lucky 7 wanted people to think about what television viewing did to them. What did they get out of it? Their whole lives are just kind of deteriorating watching the same schlock. You wanted to give TV the aura of being memorable. A single mediocre ad vanishes in the mind, but an interruption stays there forever. We have no idea where anyone involved with the Lucky 7 broadcast even is nowadays, but wherever they may roam, they sure as hell have their place in broadcasting history. Thanks for watching today's episode of What Was. And I'll see you for the next episode. Somebody wants to get attention, what do they do? They go break into a, uh, uh, a television broadcast. Just to get attention, like throwing a brick through your window, so to speak. Okay. It's, not too sp it's not too bright, really. Well, some thought it was a lot of fun. So what did you think about the whole thing? Very, very funny.